Um, it's with uh, very great pleasure that I introduce to you our Abramson visiting professor, Dr. Gary Dunnington. We can hear you. Me speaking softly. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Gary Dunnington joined the faculty of Indiana University School of Medicine in August of 2012, where he is the J. L. Grossfeld Professor and Chair of Surgery. He received his MD degree from Indiana University and completed his surgical training at the University of Arizona. Dr. Dunnington came to Indiana University after 15 years at Southern Illinois University, University of Southern Illinois, where he served since 2000 as the Professor and Chair of Surgery there. Prior to his tenure at SIU, he was Associate Professor of Surgery and Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at University of Southern California School of Medicine. Dr. Dunnington's area of clinical practice is surgical oncology with a focus in breast and endocrine disease. He's developed two multidisciplinary breast centers, first at University of Southern California, the Norris Cancer Center there, and at Southern Illinois University and served as the medical director of both. He has served as principal or co-investigator on research projects totaling greater than $5.6 million and has more than 145 peer-reviewed publications. He has received a total of 19 institutional teaching awards having been, and having been named Outstanding Faculty Teacher of the Year nine times at four institutions and including the 2010 Outstanding Teacher of the Year Award for the Southern Illinois University School of Medicine and the 2011 Outstanding Teacher Award of the Year at the university level. Also in 2010, he received the, and this is a prestigious award, the AOA Robert Glaser Distinguished Teacher Award from the AAMC, the American Association of Medical Colleges. He is a past president of the Association for Surgical Education, and he received the 1999 Distinguished Educator Award from that organization. He is one of the five founding faculty of the American College of Surgeons, Surgeons as Educators course, and served as a faculty member for 15 years. He's been a visiting professor of education to departments of surgery in 65 medical schools in North America, 66, <laughs> and to 75 surgical training programs. His topic for this morning's talk is measuring and improving performance in surgical skills training I think we're going to learn a lot from Dr. Dunnington. Please help, uh, help me welcome him. Thanks very much, and it's a privilege to be here, especially at this time of the year. Uh, it always brings back lots of memories as I watch the presentation of the chairs and the rocking chair and uh, all the tradition that surrounds it. And it was particularly encouraging this morning to see the rich research culture here. That bodes well for any program where residents are engaged in research, and especially when faculty block out a half day of their activity to be present for that. Uh, that's not always common, so uh, it was wonderful to see. I'm talking about something that, today that I've been uh, involved in now for a number of years, uh, and I guess as I say I have nothing to disclose, I do want to disclose one thing. I think often when I talk uh, about these topics to programs around the country, uh, there's the sense that I'm suggesting or recommending that this is the bar for all programs in the United States. And I, I want to say right up front, I don't expect that. It's something uh, that I've been passionate about. It's one of the reasons I became a chair, as they say, so I could do it my way. But it's really so that I could really drive some of these things and create these things. And so I want to make it clear that I'm not expecting that the departmental budget at LSU go to this level or that you do all of these things. My only hope is that as I present some of these ideas, some may be things that the educators and leaders in the room would say, we could do that. We could start doing that even though we may not now. That's the goal and intent. So I want to be very clear because I've, uh, I think I've been misunderstood in some of those areas. I think context is important. So some of the things we do have to do because of the nature of our training program and its size. Uh, our residents rotate through all uh, these programs in the city of Indianapolis. There are five hospitals on our medical center campus, including the University Hospital, uh, the VA Medical Center, a large county hospital, a children's hospital, and then the largest of those, the IU Health Methodist Hospital, and then three suburban IU Health hospitals as well. And our residents rotate in all of those except the, uh, the one hospital, the IUH Saxony. 
So it's a large number of residents, about 100 altogether in our training program and fellowships and integrated programs, uh, and that's the context of the comments I'll make. Let me give you what I believe in 2018 is the reality, the reality of resident evaluation. About 20 to 25 percent of residents have performance problems identified during training. Most we do a good job of identifying pretty early, in our case usually in boot camp. We have very poor strategies. We don't do a very good job of diagnosing the problem, and our remediation is often very generic. It's the penicillin for everything. You need to read more. I think when I first heard this data presented, and particularly when I realized that most residents complete training with the same problems they started with, I said to my PhD educator at the time, well, I'm glad that's not the case at my institution. And he challenged me and he said, what would you like for us to do a study? So he did a 30-year study of all the surgical residents in the training program at Southern Illinois University. The only difference was our figure was 23%. So I'm convinced this is a universal phenomenon, surgery, medicine, pediatrics, whatever it is. The challenge is on us for doing a better job of diagnosing and treating. Several years ago, we published this article, which to our best understanding represented the problems in resident evaluation. And I put them from most likely to least likely. The most likely and pr problematic is we just don't sample enough performances, not enough ratings, raters, and skills sampled. By far and away, that's the number one problem. The others are much mi more minor. Inaccuracies due to over-reliance on memory, the best illustration of end of, of, of resident evaluation, end of resident rotation evaluations, sometimes for a two-month rotation, we're trying to recall back for those 60 days and give meaningful feedback. Someone said it would be very similar to doing two months of clinics, and then at the end of the two months, trying to dictate those clinic notes. Now, we have some residents that actually try that, but it's not a, it's not a very good idea, and your accuracy really falls off. And then others uh, are problems, but nothing like the first one. This was startling a few years ago. I was present when it was presented at American Surgical. It came from our institution. Survey of program directors, fellowship of council program directors that said 43% felt incoming fellows were unable to independently perform 30 minutes of a major procedure and independently form basic operations like a lap coli. This created a stir, tremendous discussion, and sort of the cry, what are we doing in residency training that's falling so short of where we expect residents to be with technical skills as they finish? Similarly, nearly the same time, a bit earlier, Dick Bell, president of Central Surgical, gave his presidential address titled, Why Johnny Cannot Operate. Now, had I been President Bell, I probably would have called it why Johnny and Jessica cannot operate, but the keys in my mind are these two fundamental problems. Inadequate experience in residency training, and it may not be a volume problem, it may be an autonomy problem. We're going to deal with that. And I believe fundamental in all of this is an absence of formal assessment of operative skills. Doesn't mean you don't have a skills lab, may even have a skills curriculum, but as I visit so many programs and ask about their assessment, there is no answer to that question. And Lord Kelvin, many years ago, said to all of us, if you can't measure it, you cannot improve it. And nothing, there's no area where that's more prevalent than surgical skills development. So I'm going to cover a few of these areas, uh, surgical skills performance, a bit about team-based performance. In follow-up of the presentation this morning, how should we be assessing OR performance, enhancing and measuring autonomy, I'm going to give you just a couple tips on teaching in the OR that I think will be helpful after our discussion this morning. And then I think the direction we're all moving in the next decade is moving towards a proficiency training of residents, and I'll finish with that. I became fascinated as a very young program director at the University of Southern California when a towering six foot five chief of urology came into my office one day and stood over me in a very threatening way, said, I don't know what's wrong with these residents after they finished two years in your program. When they come to us, they have no idea even how to tie knots and do basic suturing. We're not sure what you're doing in general surgery, but it's not enough, and walked out of the office. That was a pivotal point in my career as a young surgeon educator, and I realized we've got to do something different than we're doing at the present time. That started my interest in surgical skills laboratories. I looked around the world. There was only a couple places doing it. University of Toronto had a big head start. And so we were determined at the University of Southern California that we would design a comprehensive surgical skills laboratory. And I've been on that uh, quest for about the last 25 years. I'm convinced that we need to look at it more like we do the training of a professional. 
There's so many parallels, and yet we've ignored it for most of our time. If you talk to a young student who's going for the first time to the Juilliard School of Music, imagine if they arrive on day one and say to their professor, I was wondering when I might be able to go to Carnegie. Well, they would first laugh, and then they would say, young man or young woman, you're going to spend months of your life in one of these dingy little practice rooms, and maybe if you prove proficient, then you'll get to go to the performance arena. And yet, typically, often not to me, but to other interns, new interns will say, so when do I get to go to the OR? One of the common questions on the interview circuit, how early do residents get to the OR? That's the wrong question. The question should be, what do you do to prepare residents to go to the operating room? And that's where we've been deficient. The whole fundamental concept of which a surgical skills laboratory is based is this Erickson deliberate practice. And I'm sure you're familiar with it, but as I look at this, what I say is, where can we best duplicate those items? And I would say that for junior residents, not in the OR on a consistent basis. For chief residents, almost every time with good faculty. But the only place you can do this for junior residents with a well-defined task, right difficulty, great feedback, opportunity to repeat and correct errors, it's in a surgical skills laboratory. And so early on, I became convinced that we ought to be thinking of this as practice arena to performance arena. And the practice arena is the skills lab. So my promise to new interns, you're going to spend a lot of time in the practice arena. And we're going to really focus on your surgical skills. And then maybe you can go to the performance arena if you prove you're proficient. So the rationale is pretty solid. It avoids exposing patients to the sharpest slope of the skills learning curve. I am quite sure if consumers in my era of residency training knew the way it really was in July and August, they would have run to the nearest community hospital. But we have sort of dampened that methodology over the years, but I think we're getting closer to being able to be honest with consumers as to how we train residents. Clearly enhances the quality of teaching. Never would I want to go back to those days where interns in July walked into the OR and wanted to learn how to tie knots and do suturing and the basic skills. Finally, potential to significantly decrease the number of operative cases. So when people say, how can you deal with all of the increasing technology and still have a five-year residency? The answer is a skills lab. That's a simple answer. And in fact, Darcy at the Imperial College in London has really good data that says hour for hour, in early years, it's more efficient in the skills lab than in the OR. I think most senior surgeons would see very easily how that's the case. Well, we've been doing this for a few years. You would think we've learned a little. Um, not enough, clearly, but here's some of the lessons. Early on, I put chief residents in fourth years and everybody in the skills labs, and that's largely gone. Most benefit is in years one and two. I learned early on this has to be mandatory. There are too many things pulling on residents in multiple directions, going to clinic, going to the OR, taking care of dictations. So early on it became clear if there's a skills lab held, high level of expectation for the faculty and the residents. Multiple training platforms. So it's not enough just to have really good, good uh, VR. You need all things and be able for each skill, what's the best platform to teach this? After about five years of this work, I realized faculty were getting a little burned out. You want me to teach another suturing lab to brand new interns? And realize we can really replace faculty for a lot of these basic skills with skills coaches. We did a lot of the early work at this at SIU where we did prospective trials between an award-winning plastic surgeon teaching suturing and a skills coach trained by a surgeon. The outcome was the same. So we have really transitioned for a lot of the basic skills uh, we have two full-time people in our skills lab and a sports psychologist who really helps us immensely with some of the performance barriers. And then after doing this for a while in residency, we started wondering, why are we waiting to start this in residency? We ought to be doing this in medical school long before they ever get to residency. So our simulation and our surgery clerkship just increases more and more. We rolled out these cases early on. Hard to do without a nurse educator. Again, consumes a lot of faculty time. So we have a full-time nurse educator that's just focused on uh, training in the setting of the Sim Center and the, the clinical wards. So these are the scenarios they run through. And every time we ask their opinion at the end of a clerkship, they say, could we have fewer lectures and more simulation? So now we've recently doubled the amount of simulation. This is clearly meaningful learning experiences for medical students. Several of you mentioned yesterday this surgery readiness elective, and it was actually one of those nurse educators at SIU, where we had two nurse educators, came to me one day and said, Dr. Dunnington, I don't think we're doing a very good job preparing our fourth year students for July 1 of surgery residency. 
Have you ever thought of doing a readiness elective? Entirely her idea. Brought it to David Rogers, then the clerkship director, and I said, sounds like something we ought to experiment with. Within two or three years, it was oversubscribed, the most popular senior elective, and we realized this really is something that's needed, and now, as you know, it's in most medical schools in the country. This is what ours looks like, similar to others. The most popular are mock pages, and I understand you do that here. So our nurse educator calls uh, these uh, senior medical students all hours of the day and evening. We don't ask her to call at 2 o'clock in the morning. That would be more realistic. Gives them a scenario. I'm with your patient on 2 South. They've just fallen out of bed. The leg is at this really strange angle. I'm not sure what's going on. What should I do? The intern gives their feedback, or the fourth year student gives feedback, and then they get rich feedback of what they should have done and how they should have managed it. I think there's at least one person in the audience that's actually been through this uh, session at Indiana University. Intensive skills, laboratory sessions, survivor skills, they need to hear from residents. Here are the things you ought to be thinking about as you approach July 1. Our skills curriculum is really based on these three phases of the ACS, APDS curriculum. And usually when I give this talk, I'm not aware of what's being used at the place I'm visiting, so I don't know what you're currently using. I'm probably a little more biased. I was the director of this curriculum development process, and it was one of the most significant things in my career to really start from the beginning and say, what are the skills we ought to be teaching new interns and mid-level residents? And so this is a curriculum that's now in its second or third iteration, continues to be revised, but it's broken up in these areas. This is the way we implemented at IU. In phase one, this is for everybody. If you're a surgeon, whether you're a neurosurgeon or an orthopedic surgeon, most of these you need. So these are all part of our uh, boot camp. And then for phase one, we do it this way. We have a training camp for all PGY1s in plastics, urology, CT, vascular, general surgery. That's about 28 interns, which is the maximum size of our skills laboratory. It's a fairly intensive series of sessions that 12 weeks beginning the first week of August allow them to get a little acclimated and then start the sessions. They're twice a week, uh, two-hour sessions, all by faculty. These are scheduled a full year in advance, so no faculty is able to say, I'm sorry, I have a case in the OR or a clinic scheduled. They're scheduled well in advance. And importantly, going back to the assessment issue, you have to complete nine of the 11 verification of proficiency modules before you graduate from training camp. Phase two are all of these sessions. We use cadavers heavily. We do it in about four sessions throughout the year. And then while that cadaver is out in the skills lab for a week, we may have three sessions a day. So intense training in multiples. Uh, and most of these are cadaver or live animal. And again, trying to decide what's the best platform to teach this skill. We use virtual reality, but we're going to ask the question very clearly, is there a less expensive way to do it? And does this really teach the skill? So we probably have less VR than people may think. We use the lap mentor. I don't think there's anything better for some of the basic tasks. There's no good model for lap appendectomy or colectomy or incisional hernia, although we do use cadaver for lap, uh, laparoscopic colectomy. Uh, so this is really good for those areas. Obviously, we have to use this for the endoscopic surgery to be certified in fundamentals of endoscopic surgery, so we use the uh, GI Bronc mentor for that. Some other areas, it's even more powerful. So we have an I-6 and a traditional cardiac training program. And I have just been amazed that for decades now, you allow a cardiac resident to do their first coronary artery bypass graft in the OR on a, on a real patient. I can assure you, I never want to be the victim of that as a patient. And so we finally convinced them and invested $100,000 in this kind heart simulator, which if you close, uh, sort of put blinders on and just look at the OR field, it's a pig heart fully perfused you would be convinced you're in the OR. So it is a wonderful model, and now our residents uh, do a number of valves and coronary artery bypass grafts here before they go to the OR. We're working now on learning curves. How many do you need to do before you're ready to go to the OR? And then the third phase is team-based training. It's the most complicated to do. I'd be interested to see how much is done here. Uh, anytime you do training across multiple departments, it gets challenging. Uh, I like this team-based training photo because if you look at the big guy in the center there, you think he's not sweating it out? I mean, it's realistic enough to cause people to have a lot of anxiety. When we first started doing this with third-year residents, more anxiety than I could imagine. One or two I thought was going to have to have a time out. Uh, it was so dramatic for them. This is one of the first ones we did several years ago, uh, the intraoperative crisis, so we use a, a simulated operating room, anesthesia residents, nursing students, so they really get interprofessional training. And as soon as they put the trocar in the patient, they inadvertently pierce the vena cava and the patient starts to exsanguinate. 
goes into full-blown shock, and we're looking for a number of things as to how they manage that scenario. And then, of course, we utilize the skills of Commander Hammer here, was a, a Navy commander at USC, did all of the onboarding of all the military personnel before they went to Af Iraq and Afghanistan, and then he debriefed them. Uh, when our residents have been debriefed by Commander Hammer, they have been debriefed. And so it's a wonderful addition to the program uh, for this, this kind of uh, team-based training. Here's what we're trying to incorporate in team-based training. So when we designed the first 10 scenarios, we tried to work these skills in and out of all of the scenarios. So we're teaching them leadership and coping with stress and situation awareness, lots of basic skills that I think residents really need to know. And you cannot teach these just in the setting of an actual operating room. This is the way we do simulation. And again, not saying it's the only way, but we have three areas of focus. We have a new 1,600 square foot surgical skills laboratory, the Center for Surgical Outcome, which is live animal surgery, and then our simulation center, which is run by the medical school. This is the, I think, the third skills laboratory I've designed. I think one or two more, and I'll get it right. But I wanted it to be a bright, airy center, a place faculty like to come. I wanted to eliminate that horrible smell of uh, formaldehyde and all the reasons people give as excuses not going to a skills laboratory. We have state-of-the-art lighting, which is probably better than in our university OR. And you can see a number of these have large things on the bottom, which are cameras, which we use for testing. This is our live animal laboratory. This is where we would do things like ADAM, the ADAM course for learning trauma uh, kinds of things. So here's one of our third year residents uh, being instructed by one of our trauma surgeons. This is a one-on-one -on -one scenario where they get a picture of an injury at the door of the uh, live animal laboratory. And then they go in in the pig model. And if it's a crushed small bowel, they diagnose it, decide how they're going to manage it, do the actual repair. Uh, while they're being mentored by the faculty surgeon. I'm not sure, do you do the Adam course here? It's a wonderful addition, really, I think, helps uh, trauma. And you could say, well, I've heard from your residents already that if there's one thing they would like, maybe a little less trauma. Well, I can assure you they think that in our program with three level one trauma centers on the same campus. Uh, but we still think this is vital to prepare them for their time as trauma surgeons. This is the, uh, it's almost like a hospital. It's the simulation center on main, on main part of campus where we have outpatient areas and inpatient rooms and operating rooms. And this is the setting where we do our team-based training. It looks like this uh, in the actual <coughs> OR in that center. Well, let's go to evaluation, because we've said this is where we fall short. So I've been to centers and have seen beautiful facilities. They show me their curriculum. But it falls short in really doing assessment that prepares them for the performance arena. When I first suggested to the group designing the curriculum several years ago, why don't we just use OSATs, Objective Structured Assessment of Technical Skills developed by Richard Resnick and his colleagues at Toronto. Before I could hardly get the words out of my mouth, these other directors from all over North America said, forget it. That may work at SIU in Toronto, but it won't work anywhere else. We're never going to get our faculty to spend a half day, two or three times a year, sitting down and watching residents perform procedures in multiple stations. So we went back to the drawing board and created a more faculty-friendly way of assessing these skills. Now, I've added to this slide what today would be more popularly called EPAs. We're in the EPA era. I could give you some sideline comments about that, but it's the reality. Entrustable professional activities, but I call them verification of proficiency modules. We created all of these areas where we said, we don't really want residents doing this on real patients until we can verify they know how to do it. So knot tying and basic suturing and chest tube and all of these things that are so fundamental. And then this is the way it works. For each of these, we have a video of expert performance. They have the skills laboratory. And then they practice and practice on their own time, if necessary, 24-hour access to the skills lab. And then when they think they're ready, they step under the camera and have a video, elbows down, so it's blinded. Then we have a video capture system that takes that and sends it to a faculty desktop where they have a validated instruments, and they rate their performance with very rich feedback. But the final thing is, are they ready to come to my OR? And if they are, it's thumbs up, you pass. If they say, not yet, and you fail, you go back to the skills lab with more practice. This is where we bring in the sports psychologist who's going to help you take advantage of all of that feedback, get retested. So for example, you're not going to do a vascular access graft with the transplant surgeons until you've first been verified as proficient in vascular anastomosis. Now, to me, that makes perfect sense. But that's not the way it's done all across the country, as you know. This is what it looks like on a desktop. All we know is this is intern number 1208. 
Now, they can sometimes guess. Uh, but we ask them not to talk during the video. Uh, and so they really get a chance to see, do I want to teach this resident on a procedure in the OR, or would I rather they spend a little more time in practice? We're always looking for ways to make it more faculty friendly. So we think here by sending it to their desktop and letting them doing it at their own time and, and evening if necessary, that's one thing. We're now working with a number of biomedical engineers at Purdue, an hour away, to try to be able to automate this. And we're very close in things like knot tying to be able to get the data we need from sensors developed by the engineers so that we may not even have to use the skills coach to teach some of these and particularly evaluate some of these skills. There's another thing that we've incorporated, and I give the credit to this to Dimitri Stefanidis, who I recruited uh, a couple of years ago as our vice chair of education. Dimitri was, I thought, the premier surgical education researcher in the US today and had funding from AHRQ to develop a comprehensive mental skills curriculum. And again, this would be routine in the military and other high performance areas. We've ignored it in surgery. So now all of our residents, after data shows overwhelmingly that they, they perform better in the OR under stress if they have these mental skills, they go through training with our sports psychologist on things like mental imagery, goal setting, energy management, attention management, refocusing strategies in a difficult scenario, performance routines. It has been exciting to develop real simulation for some of these things, trying to recreate the stress of the operating room environment in a simulated OR. But they've got quite creative. They uh, obviously have an attending who's ranting and telling them to please hurry up. I've got another case. And about that time, the telephone rings and the coordinator's wondering why they haven't logged their cases. And then the nurse accidentally drops a metal container on the floor. And, and you can just see getting rattled. And so we're able to say, how do residents perform in stress in the OR with and without mental skills curriculum? And the preliminary data really looks impressive. And again, it's one of those things as I see the data, I say, why haven't we done this before now? But it's a really exciting new area. Let's go to the OR. What drove the research in this area was as a young program director in May, about the last few weeks, residents coming into my office and dropping down a list of all the cases they've done and asked me to just sign off, which meant you're proficient. You're capable of doing all these operations. And in my heart, I knew you know, maybe 10% of them. But that's all we did. We didn't ever test an individual operating procedure. We had these global evaluations at the end of two months and assumed that was adequate. And I increasingly became so uncomfortable with that approach, I said to our research team, we have to find a better way. So we embarked on a number of things. So let me answer this question, because someone will ask it if I don't answer it right now. We wouldn't have to worry about any of this if we just picked senior medical students with brilliant aptitude in surgical skills. If we could just predict which ones are going to be superstars, maybe we wouldn't even need a skills laboratory. Well, the reason I developed a skills laboratory is because now there's 52 studies looking at all of these variables, mostly neuropsychologic testing, and no single test or combination of tests ever can predict a senior medical student and say they will be a successful surgical resident in the OR. So I keep looking at the studies. I'm not very optimistic because my own argument to our team has been, perhaps if you did these combined with a test of emotional intelligence and a test of resilience, I think the three of those might predict who's going to be a great surgical resident. But we're still working on that model. I'll tell you if we ever figure it out. So we do not test senior students with surgical skills when they come to interview. I still find programs that are doing that. I think it's an intimidating experience and more likely to drive students away than to ever get them to come to your program. We first developed the OPRS, and this brought back lots of memories as I heard uh, the presentation this morning, developing your first little instrument to evaluate in the OR. Uh, so we did this, uh, now I guess it's 13 years ago. And so we identified what are those commonly performed or technically challenging procedures. Then we did comprehensive review of the literature to say, what are the steps in that procedure that cause bad outcomes? Because that's obviously what we want to measure. And then we got faculty consensus. We took it uh, and it added to it the five validated general performance measures from Toronto because I wanted a case-specific instrument. What you presented this morning is being used in a lot of places as just a generic. Things like other goals for laparoscopic surgery, a lot of those out there are just generic. We wanted to be able to have a specific instrument for an inguinal hernia, as importantly for the faculty, the new faculty in particular, to help them begin to think, these are the steps you really ought to be looking at in evaluating this performance. So we did that and created at Indiana something called personal best surgery, but we had the same problems you're going to face. 
I would get faculty these 10 item forms. And they would say, Dr. Dunnington, you know how much time that takes? And you want to do it after every operation? It's just not going to happen. So we continued to work. The next step was to make it an app on your iPhone. So at least it was easier. But they still said, 10 items? You want us to fill out 10 items on every case? About that time, at Northwestern, they were beginning to work on the Zwish scale of autonomy. They believed that all you had to do was assess how much autonomy a resident was given during the case, and that was a surrogate for proficiency. Now, I always had trouble with that, but I knew they were onto something important as autonomy. So one day, I called my research colleague up there that we had done research together for about 25 years, Dr. Deborah DeRosa, and I said, Deb, why don't we put our two teams together? What if we put the best of best surgery and the best of your Zwish autonomy scale into one scale? I think that may be the best of all possible worlds, and it would be faculty friendly. That resulted in uh, hours and hours of phone calls and research, and eventually, Simple was born. I'll tell you more about Simple. Here's what we learned that drove us to think there's got to be a better way. So for a lot of these early forms, we took them to the American Board of Surgery for validation. We had a group of experts sitting around video monitors in the American Board of Surgery and then rating them using our instrument to be sure that they all would rate similarly a similar performance. Here's what we learned by that process. Understanding the components of an operation can really improve evaluation and feedback. I told you early on, faculty don't do very well with OR feedback. It's generic. It's praise. It's not often very specific. Here's what we learned. And this has helped my performance. At the end of a case, it would be much more helpful to a resident, instead of saying, you're really struggling, to say, here's where your problems are. It's specifically in technical skills. You need work in forward planning. You need more self-direction. The problems came around patient safety and judgment. Your cautery was constantly getting too close to the small bowel. And situation awareness. So all of those things, based on over 1,000 expert comments, at least have helped us to be more precise about our feedback. The second thing we learned that guidance interferes with evaluations and attendings really underestimate the amount of guidance they provide. Now this was a real eye opener. Because I also, as other expert teachers like Dr. Griffin, felt that the best way, I didn't realize until they showed me a video of my teaching, the method I was using of, profound, of giving profound guidance to chief residents was just talking to the medical students. Now the next thing Dr. So-and-so is going to do, he's going to isolate the sac. And after that, the next thing, and the residents would just wait for my cues. So I was provi providing unbelievable guidance and didn't even recognize it until they showed me my own videotape. I still think it's a good strategy, Dr. Griffin. Don't, don't abandon it. And here's what we learned. Several years ago, an educator says, this is the vector for increasing autonomy. So if you have a brand new intern in the first six months of the year, it's probably appropriate that you're sort of a helicopter attending. You want to sort of hover over every move and coach and direct. But that's miserable for a chief resident when you're still utilizing that same hovering approach in your teaching methodologies. So we started to say we've got to do a better job of promoting autonomy and as surgical attendings, knowing when to drop out the cues as residents get better, instead of giving the same kinds of cues for a chief resident that we give for an intern. Here's what we've learned. Sort of, this, sort of this was from large focus groups. We asked the residents, so tell us who the faculty that give you the best autonomy of all. That was one group. And then who are those faculty? They won't let go even if you're a chief resident. They just continue to provide little autonomy. So we had focus groups on both ends to gain as much as we could. So one of the things that we came away with was we ought to sequence increasingly complex steps for graduated autonomy. I asked our chief of liver transplant one day, tell me how you do it with a fellow in transplant. Right off the bat, he rattled off this schema. He said, well, they're going to just watch for about 15 cases. And then maybe we'll let them do a hyalur dissection and then strip the liver off the vena cava, and probably not until year two before they do the entire case. Well, that may be a little rigid, but at least it's a sequence. I think young attendings have the idea that residents ought to be able to do every case as soon as they walk into your OR. I think that's fundamentally flawed in education. So for example, as a breast surgeon, I'm very clear, you won't do an axillary dissection until you've first done the axillary dissection skills laboratory. So I've had a chance to coach you with our other breast surgeons. And then on the first one, you'll probably watch me do part of it, and then gradually you'll do more and more. And every attending ought to have a schema of that for commonly performed procedures. Minimize queuing for senior residents. 
It's interesting that some residents will say, they're really great for interns, but they're not so good for chiefs. This is what they're referring to, faculty who only have one speed for providing autonomy. And then I'm going to give you a method that I think is the single, one of the single best things that I've published in this whole area, and, and I didn't have any idea what they were even doing. It, what, my name's on it, but it was a PhD educator, who early on at SIU said, do you mind if I come into your OR? Because she said, I hear from the residents that feedback is a problem in this institution. Remember, that's every institution. So she said, I think if I just watch some cases for a few days, I might get some ideas. She watched me, and she developed with the rest of the colleagues what's now the BID method for OR teaching. So for those of you who want to go out this afternoon or tomorrow and make one dramatic improvement in your teaching technique, here it is. This also now is being taught in workshops all over the country. Three steps. First, briefing. At the scrub sink today, let's assume you're working with a chief resident who's done 75 lap coles. That ought to be your needs assessment at the scrub sink. So how many of these have you done? And then you say to the resident, so of all of these you've done, what's the one area you feel you still struggle with and would like to get better in? I would assure you that even a chief resident, if they're really thoughtful and they know you're going to ask this, they'll come up with something. So the first time I did this, Brad Paris, who's now a colorectal surgeon on the faculty, you'll be working with Dr. Paris soon, I did a lap coli, and he was just starting his chief year. And he said to me, well, now that you mention it, I feel like I'm not very agile with my left hand. It's awkward. I don't know when to re-grasp, et cetera. And I said, OK, that's all we're going to focus on that particular skill when we get to that part of the operation. Then you go to the operating room. You do your usual teaching scripts with medical students and everyone else. But when you get to that part of the operation, you slow down. And you give them the best pearls you've ever had on how to use your left hand in a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And then at the end of the case, unless it's feedback that is best delivered in private, but you say at the end, so tell me what your thoughts are now that we've focused on this. What are you going to take away? How are you going to do it differently? You don't really have to give much more. They really understand what they need to do. And then give them your own feedback if necessary. This sounds so simple, but it is of profound importance. I'll never forget Brad Paris as we walked out of the OR that day. He was now an early chief resident. He said, so Dr. Dunnington, why did you wait until I'm a chief to start doing this? And I realized we had really failed. So if you're looking for something specific, try the BID method. And I, I'm convinced the resident response will be very positive. Let me give you one other tip. If you don't like BID, try this. So for the attendings in the room, let me ask if you've ever had this experience in July and August with maybe a new intern or a second year doing a case that's at their limit for technical skills. And they get to a certain part, and it's really not going well. And you start giving them feedback, obviously very positively, you know, encouraging tones. But you give them this feedback and all of this information, and nothing changes. They just keep right on operating, doing the same thing as if they're ignoring you. And that's often the feeling you may get. Well, they're not ignoring you. They don't have the attentional capacity to listen to you. So attentional capacity is how much our brain can possibly focus on one thing at any one time. So for example, when you're an expert at driving, you can do 10 other things while you're driving, some things you shouldn't be doing, and still manage to do it reasonably well. But if you're a new intern trying to do a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, it takes 100% of your capacity to focus on the skill at hand. And now you're trying to heap feedback on top of that and get them to do something differently, it's not going to happen. So if you just realize that, and I'm ashamed to say it took me about 20 years to start incorporating this in my teaching, Instead, here's the steps. When you feel they're not listening, think the best of them. They're just not able. Stop the case and say to them, so what do you think I stopped you? What do you think's going not well? And then here's why I think you need to improve your performance. Here's what I want you to try. Do you get that? Do you understand what I'm saying? OK, let's restart. I guarantee you, you will have less of a sense that you're being ignored. So it'll be good for your self-esteem. But more importantly, your feedback will be accepted by someone who is otherwise at the limit of their attentional capacity. So we do, we're doing a lot of research on attentional capacity. There's wonderful models as to how you measure it. For example, we're trying to train our residents on VR not just to proficiency, but proficiency and above because of issues of attentional capacity. When they get in the OR, they won't be as focused as they are in the skills lab. So that's a, that's a whole body of research. Next, insist on resident preparedness. For my residents, I say to them, if you've known the day before you had an axillary dissection, and I say, what did you read to prepare for this 
your second axillary dissection, and they say, I, I just didn't get around to it last night. Even if it's something so pleasant as my child had a birthday party. I say, well, that's good. I appreciate you being a good parent, but you're going to watch me today. And I think there's a lot you can learn just watching and first assisting. And next time, uh, if you have time to prepare, you can do the case. I don't think that's harsh at all. It's realistic and sets expectations. One of the most profound lessons we learned from the focus groups when we asked faculty, why don't you give more autonomy? They say, how can I? I do an, an APR with a resident today, and then the next time I do it with that resident may be a year and a half from now. How do I know what their skill set is? How do I know how much I can trust them? They said, if you let us work with one resident for two months, then we could be able to provide autonomy. We said, okay, we'll take you up on it. We're measuring autonomy, so we'll create six apprenticeship rotations. Now, we only selected ones that had great faculty teachers and high volume. They weren't running off traveling every other week. And those have become, without question, the highest rated rotations that we have. That's somewhat similar to the Northwestern experience when they did this. But now they do an APR four a week or five a week. When they're on the HPB service, they may do four Whipples a week for two months in a row. They start to get that. And more importantly, the resident gets more and more autonomy as the attending trusts them more. And then include autonomy in operative assessment, and I'll show you how. So this is the autonomy scale. This has now been validated. It's used all over the country named after Dr. Zwischenberger, who's the chairman of surgery at the University of Kentucky. And attendings will relate to these are the four speeds you have in the OR. One, show and tell, first year, intern, just watch me. I'm going to give you some valuable teaching points, but you're not ready to do it. Second, you're going to, you're going to hold the instruments, but I'm going to, as I used to say, move the table. Now, in other words, I'm going to assist you frequently, maybe take over parts of the procedure, Passive assist, for the most part, I'm just going to be a really good first assistant with some coaching. And hopefully for chief residents, my arms are folded, you're doing the case, and I'm talking to the medical student. That's supervision only, preferably still in the room if it's an insurance case. So here's SIMPLE. I don't know how much exposure you've had to this. SIMPLE stands for System for Improving and Measuring Procedural Learning. It's the system that was developed when we put the research together of Mass General, Northwestern, and Indiana University, our research teams, and said, what if we just created one app on your phone to measure this? And now it's three clicks. How difficult was the case? What was the overall quality with five levels? And how much autonomy did you provide? And then there's a button you push for direct, immediate feedback. Now, we've measured how long it takes to do this for faculty. So anybody who says that's just too much work, I can tell you that for me, it takes between 45 and 60 seconds to do this. Click, click, click. Did a good job in the OR today, but here's three things I think you struggled with. So the next time we do this operation, I want you to focus specifically on this skill, end of dictation. Resident gets that the afternoon. If you've got a case with me the next morning, I want to know that they've listened to that and they're trying to focus on that skill. So it really is good. Now, we still use that long 10-item form if we have a resident in difficulty. They need a lot of specific feedback. But the other gives great evaluation of technical skill. We rolled it out several months ago now. It's now a not-for-profit corporation. It's a wonderful research collaborative, and the amount of data we're accumulating is giving us a lot of valuable lessons. We now have completed it for iPhone, the Android. Uh, I'm not sure of the latest count of programs. It started as a pilot project in 14 programs. I think we're getting close to 50 training programs are now using the simple app. Now even programs way beyond surgery. Anything that's procedural can use this app. And here's what we're learning. So by the way, the resident also fills it out. So as I leave the OR, I say to the resident, so would you be sure to finish your simple app on this case? Usually by the time I get back to the office or within an hour or two, I get a red dot on my app on my phone that says resident is completed, waiting for your evaluation. And it's quite interesting to look at how much autonomy the resident thinks you gave them and how much you think you gave them. I would assure you those don't always match, but that's valuable to look at. Here's as you can see, uh, 4,000 observations, over 400 residents, and this data is accumulating. We really didn't know until now how much autonomy are we giving chief residents across the United States. And as you can see, at chief resident level, only 70% are at the level we would consider ready for private practice. That's a bit of a concern. 30% of the time, we said, not there, not getting a 4 or a 5 rating. Here's autonomy scores, and this was even more concerned. So I know the American Board of Surgery has been wondering, how can we assure that a program gives autonomy? And they're looking for measures currently, and we've basically responded, this is it. 
This is a precise view in your program. So across the country, again, in over 4,000 evaluations, chief residents had the highest two levels of autonomy only about 70% of the time. Now, attendings could say, well, they just weren't ready for it. Or you could have attendings who just aren't willing to give autonomy. That's what has to be sorted out. Residents are making that decision in their mind right now, which it is here. So clearly, when this data was published, it told all of us, we have some work to do. How can we certify a resident as competent when they haven't even had adequate autonomy in the chief year? This was the dream that Reed Williams, my PhD investigator for about the last 21 years, when we first started talking about this in our Monday morning weekly meetings, we said, isn't it strange that every resident knows their absite performance score? You know exactly how you compare to your peers, but we don't have anything for operative performance. Wouldn't it be great if someday we could say to a resident, you're at the 14th percentile nationally for other PGY3 residents in operative skills? I think most would say, I'll think I'll go to the skills lab and do a little practice. Well, we're there. Finally, after about 15 years of work, this system in a national database maintained at the University of Michigan, in the next few months, we'll be able to start giving residents and program directors for every resident where they rank by six-month intervals. All residents in the last half of their third year, here's where your resident ranks among peers. And obviously, the more residency programs on Simple, the better. I think this is a major step forward, which will finally give us an overall evaluation. Uh, just a few months ago, we published in Annals of Surgery what we thought were reasonable guidelines based on about 10 years of research for individual operative performances. This is what we know based on the literature. First of all, single performances directly observed. We think that's probably better than watching a videotape. What we learned that if you don't rate that performance within 72 hours, you might as well not rate it. It's like a global rating, sort of your overall view of a resident, a halo effect, as we say. So we are so convinced by this data that if you try to rate a performance more than 72 hours, you get locked out. It should include a report of autonomy. You ought to have faculty rater training. So particularly around autonomy, we train faculty. So here's a picture in the OR. Which Zwish rating do you think that deserves? We have to get faculty on the same page. Then obviously we do lots of faculty development around teaching in the OR and evaluating in the OR. Now I want to mention, this was mentioned this morning, there's no question that face-to-face -face feedback right at the end of the case, sitting down with a cup of coffee would be the ideal. But you're not the only program, you should feel good about this, where that is a real challenge. Because this faculty is racing off to another OR or a different hospital, so we still claim that's the best, it's just not always real and possible. And so we want to make sure that even if that doesn't happen, sometime in that next 72 hours, you get specific feedback. Here's what we've learned about the system. So this is program director information as you design your system for operative evaluation. You ought to really rate all. If you don't decide to rate every performance, it ought to be random. For obvious reasons, you can't say to the resident, you pick the ones where you want to get rating. Obviously, if I were a resident, I'd pick the one where I've got this procedure down, and this is a really dove-like attending who rates really well, I think I'll choose this one. So it's either all or random. In our program, our goal is all. We're trying to get to 70% compliance. We're not quite there. We know that at least 10 raters, you have to have at least 10 raters to sort of wash out their idiosyncrasies. So in your program, you've got some doves and you've got some hawks, some hard raters and some easy raters. So if it's only one or two ratings, it's not going to be reliable. You need at least 10. It seems like it's stable enough that you can give an overall report every six months. Progress decisions only made by the CCC. We're only providing the data to the CCC. They make the ultimate decision. And to assure chief year competency, you really need lots of high autonomy ratings. If you look at your own program and don't have that, you need faculty development. So the next step, as we said, uh, the last thing I want to mention is this a proficiency-based operative performance. So my mentor, Roland Full, said to me now probably 25 years ago, wouldn't it be great if residents graduated not because it's June 15th or July 1, but because they actually had proved proficient in that area and now they were ready to move on. And I remember him saying to me, I hope we have this before I retire. Well, it didn't happen. That happened back in 2000. So I said to myself, before I retire, I hope this happens. Well, the clock is running uh, and I really want to make sure this happens. Here's what it would look like. You'd have to determine the number of observations necessary for a stable assessment. We've now done this research. So if you want to know, for a lap coli, 
if you're going to rate both quality and autonomy, you have to have 23 ratings before you can be confident that it's a reliable rating. You have to focus on individual case proficiency for the common stuff. Now, this may surprise you. From American Board of Surgery, there's fewer than 10 procedures that residents do more than 20 times. Now, there may be something unique about your program, but overall, here are the cases. Lap coli, open hernia, partial colectomy, ventral hernia, a thyroidectomy, and a lap inguinal hernia, more than 20 times. The average score for most of those in the 121 procedures that program directors said you ought to be competent at, the median performance, zero. In many programs like a total gastrectomy, none when they finish residency. Not in this program, but in others. So clearly, this ought to be the focus. We ought to really be sure they're competent in that area. What are you going to do with all the other cases? Well, we believe it makes a lot of sense for all of those to use the absite approach with resident percentile comparison with their peers. So obviously, we'd be quite nervous graduating a resident at the second percentile of his peers. Just like your program director is very nervous if your senior year absite is second percentile. We're pretty concerned you may not pass the board exam. That should come as no surprise to you. So here's what we're doing. We first started with a pilot project, and we said, let's do it in the second year with the most common procedure. So our second year residents, we're just finishing year one of this, they have a lap coli module. They first start in the skills lab. They pass all the cognitive knowledge requirements. And then they move on to a pig model of lap coli. And then they go to the VR device, and they keep practicing and practicing and practicing until they reach the proficiency level. Then we give them a beeper. We have 12 surgeons that have agreed to teach lap coli a similar way, mostly MIS surgeons. And all month long, they just do one lap coli after another, one in the morning and one in the afternoon and one in the morning and one in the afternoon, all rated by the simple app. So we're learning some interesting things, like what's the learning curve look like when you do this? But obviously, from a resident's perspective, it's so much easier to focus on one procedure until I have this one down. So obviously, then, cognitive training, skill step in the laboratory, and then all of the cases with a lot of different faculty raters. Our challenge now is to take the next step. Actually, step two will be a multidisciplinary center, I'm sorry, multi-center trial using this one-month lap coli module. We now have a task force at IU, of which I'm a member, and I've charged them that in five years, in five years, I want a complete competency-based training program in general surgery. There's only one place in North America that's done that. That's the University of Toronto for orthopedics. It's been going for eight years. So some residents finish ortho residency in three and a half years, and others finish in seven. You don't graduate from hip arthroplasty until you're proficient in hip arthroplasty. So it's modular-like training. Now, obviously, as we've looked at the data as to doing this, it is very expensive. So after the first couple sessions, they said, are you sure you're willing to fund this? So that was the first question. The amount of sophisticated IT you knew you need because of the dramatic increase in the number of assessments is pretty overwhelming. So we have hired a full-time IT expert, just graduated from informatics at uh, IUPUI, to help us develop this IT platform. I hope we can do it in five years, but it would be a modular-like progression of residents, focused on the five procedures we know you have to focus on, and then others, maybe an area like critical care with a set of competencies. So you'll no longer graduate because it's July 1. Now, why haven't programs done this? Every program director and leader knows why. This is messy. Residents at all different levels and finishing at different levels, chaos. And so that's the reason. That's the reason we haven't done it, not because it's not the superior way to train and evaluate. So we'll, we'll give an update on that as we learn a lot over the next few months. Well, for my comments today, I want to make sure you understand that this is not the work of, of me. My role now is basically cheerleader and finding money. And uh, this wonderful team just does some great research every Friday at noon. And I'm, uh, I'm missing our meeting today. Uh, at noon, Dimitri Stefanidis, with all of these educators, gets around the table. We have a number now that are colleagues at Purdue, uh, human factors researchers, bioengineering, uh, many of our own faculty now, including our program director. Just an idea. I wouldn't hire Jen Choi as our new program director and she'll, until she agreed within one year to enroll in a master's in education program. She accepted that, and she's doing well. We've now launched a fellowship in surgical education. So our resident drops out after the second year, does a two-year fellowship, and gets a master's in education. 
Just in a few days, we'll have our second fellow dropping out, Betsy Huffman, so we'll have two fellows. We just finished with a fellow from Japan, and this coming year we have our international fellow from Greece. So it's a wonderful team. We, we share a lot of things together. All of the work that goes out has to be vetted by this team first, and it's a wonderful way to do educational research. As I said, my job is to find the money, and I want to give credit to Cook Biotech. It's a big corporation in Indiana. Cook uh, Medical is in Indiana. And we started talking to them early on, and after we had our skills lab, we tried to help them catch the vision of how critical this was for surgical training. And they generously gave us a grant over 10 years of $2 million. So it's wonderful to have that foundation as our research team lines up the studies for each individual year. So in summary, here's what I've tried to emphasize. You have to separate practice arena from performance arena. You don't go to the performance arena until you've been to the practice arena. Broadly sample trainee performance. Several years ago, they said, how many do you need? As a graduating resident or at the end of your third year, how many ratings do you have to have on that resident to be reliable? Well, again, we've done that research. It's 38. If you didn't have to measure interaction skills and those kinds of things, it would be less. So for a program director, just look and count them up. Cameos, OR performances, end of rotation, all the ratings you have, do you have at least 38 per year that's required for reliability? Measure performance based on direct observation. Several years ago, my PhD educator came in one morning with our resident rating form and asked me, how many of these did you observe the last time you completed one? And I was embarrassed. There were at least 10 items on there I would never observe. Like one of them says, obtains informed consent in a high quality manner. I've never watched a resident obtain informed consent, but that didn't keep me from rating it, obviously. But instead, it has to be based on direct observation. So we eliminated everything that's not directly observed. Provoke greater autonomy. This takes a lot of work, a lot of discussion among attendings, a lot of listening to residents who provides a lot of autonomy, and what can you learn from that attending about how they provide that kind of autonomy. And then finally, measure, don't assume for proficiency. Don't assume they spent time in the skills laboratory that they learned the skills. There's nowhere else in all of professional training we would make that sort of broad assumption. We have to stop doing it in surgical skills training. And finally, I leave you with this comment by David Leach. I think our residents recently, one faculty member asked me, is there anything in your program that residents do that's not observed and rated and evaluated? Uh, and actually, I was quite proud of, proud of that comment because whatever we measure, the goal is improvement. So as we introduce this schema to our new interns, we say to them, that you're going to feel like you're evaluated Every time you turn around, just realize it's because we love you and we're providing rich and wonderful feedback from day one. So I think uh, we really need to step our game up in this area. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here. Yes, I enjoyed very much your talk and I hope that you will continue until we get really good results from our education. <clears throat> I have a question that I think kind of you answered that one, but I want to hear more clearly from you. Regarding the uh, uh, performance and also autonomy, you know that when they change the uh, resident uh, uh, hours from unlimited to 80, without attacking or answering the other problems, so now we are faced with residents that they have to only do 80 and not more. It's not a magic that five years now is not equivalent to five years, 20 years ago, that they ex were exposed to so many cases and they become more competent to do that one. Now, in order to do that one, are you willing to say that a resident may, because he's extremely talented, to finish the surgical residency in four years, and others, which the great majority will be, five years is not enough. That's why they do 70% on their uh, the scores, or even less. So they may, rather than uh, saying that send them to a fellowship of one or two years, surgical residency, now that is 80 hours, be more to be six years, or seven years sometimes. Are we willing to do that? Or not? Yeah, I, I'd love to say to you, uh, Back in my day when I was a resident, we finished and we were so much better than residents are today. I don't think that's the case. I think the way we were able to still train in 80 hours instead of 110 hours is a skills laboratory. 
because we're much more efficient in our surgical skills training. Back then, it was learn by immersion. You just figured if you did enough cases, eventually you'd catch on. Instead of measuring that proficiency and measuring it in the OR and giving more precise feedback, we now identify a resident in boot camp if we say, oh, they're struggling. It used to be in the fourth year, we'd sit around in those semi-annual evaluations and say, wow, this resident really has a problem with technical skill. And then, of course, the comment would be, as older ones in the audience will know, well, but they're already ready to become a chief. We can't hold them back now. We just ought to let them finish. Maybe they'll choose something really simple in their ultimate practice. Well, that was embarrassing that we did that. We don't do that anymore because we pick them up early, we diagnose early, and we remediate them. Does it mean we still hold residents back? It might surprise you to know our percentage of holding residents back is probably the highest in the United States. I don't have any data, but I can tell you in the six years I've been there, I think it's happened four times. We've tried to eliminate the stigma from that because we identify early, and if by the third year they're not at third year or fourth year level ready to be promoted, we say, we're not going to promote you. The score and the data shows this. So I think our decisions are more data driven now, and if we say we need to hold you back, no big deal because we already know some finish earlier than others. And so I think we've tried to be more direct and have better data. Very good. But how you will incorporate that surgical skill? Is it part of their 80 hours or that no, it's part of, on their own? It's part of, this, part of the 80 hours. It has to be included. It's on campus, and so it has to be included. Yes. Eric, uh, wonderful talk. And you know, I've followed you and Deb DeRosa's uh, data for eight, 20 years or so. Uh, very impressive work that you guys have done over the years. I just question, you know, this is a big buy-in from everybody to do the kind of stuff you're doing, the entire faculty and everyone to do this. In today's world where a lot of institutions are putting a lot of emphasis on RVUs, on uh, productivity, and you see that more in the uh, not just private sector, but a lot of the public hospitals that have public-private partnerships, and they want you to produce a certain amount. How do you see that coming into play in teaching in academic institutions? How, how do people get RVUs for doing this kind of stuff? Can that be done? Or, uh, you know, because the institution may say, well, if you don't get 6,000 RVUs, you're not going to get your salary. Well, you're right. In most cases, it is an RVU-driven program. And as I mentioned sometime in the last couple of days, we're just revising our comp program, trying to shift away from RVUs and having 10% based entirely on academic productivity. And Tuesday night, I'm sorry, Wednesday night, I sat with all of our division chiefs, three hours of discussion around a proposed metrics that how much credit is it for teaching in a skills lab and how much credit is it for doing all of these things that generate no income but are vital to our program. And in this new revised comp program, we're going to take out $3.5 million of faculty comp. We're going to give it all back, but based on how many credits you've accumulated in teaching, citizenship, quality of care, publications, research, et cetera. Uh, this scares our faculty for only one reason. All they've been told is just more RVUs. That's how you're going to get paid. So it's a major shift, I hope, back in the other direction. Uh, but it will take a culture change to, to get there. So I think that's that's going to happen across the country. I just had a question. You know, you kind of mentioned that the fact that like this is like a professional sport or anything else. Yeah. I don't know what this is out the way, but do you think some people are unteachable? I mean, I mean, I know you said that like you know the skills and keeping them back and everything, but like a basketball player, you can put somebody in the gym and have them practice as much as you want, they're never going to be a good basketball player. So does your, does all this practice and everything, do you think delineate out some of that too? Just people like technically, they're just never going to physically. I think that group, Justin, is so small because with our ability these days, they get weeded out during medical school. They spend enough time in an OR to realize they have a visual depth perception or eye-hand coordination. I don't ever discourage a resident from going to residency if they think that's a problem. But I think uh, these days, particularly with the Surgical Skills Laboratory and what we're able to provide, I think in my now 33 years as an academic surgeon, I only remember two residents that in retrospect I probably would have said, this is not the right field for you. And I think there have been others that after three years they came to that realization on their own. They're just working and working and working around remediation of technical skills and they're just not advancing. And often they've come to me on their own and said, you know, I think radiology is probably better for me. So, uh, I'm not concerned that that's a large group, 
but I think the group is smaller because of our ability to detect early and remediate. Yes? Thank you so much. Um, I have a question about the alarming you know, autonomy and proficiency numbers yeah. that you had over years, and 70% of the time they can do the procedure. And I have a question about that. Obviously, in surgery residency, there's a rich uh, importance of doing a lot of other subspecialties like cardiothoracic surgery, surgical oncology, and gleaning experience from those subspecialties and then uh, applying them to general surgery practice, which ultimately we're trying to create general surgeons. But the part of that is that each year, as you move up in years, you're doing more and more complex cases, obviously in specialties that you're not necessarily going to be doing right the following year. And how does that work into that proficiency and autonomy? Well, that's a very sophisticated question. I'm glad you saw that issue. So here's the issue. Right now, when we measure autonomy, these, these data don't reflect whether this was for a Whipple or a lap coli. That's why I say in the future, we have to separate out those things. So I'm OK with an autonomy rating that's below supervision only for a Whipple. Because I don't expect every resident in every program to be ready to do Whipples when they leave. Justin may be ready when he goes to Lake Charles. But that's not common. That's why folks do fellowships. So that's the problem with the data here. So is that 30% that we don't have the highest autonomy? I'm hoping that's just for really complex procedures, which should lead to fellowship training. Very nice observation. You had your talk uh, clearly, nicely done, a lot of good data to share with us. Uh, maybe some of this uh, question about autonomy. Do you think because 70% only feel that they are well trained to proceed, maybe that's why some of them pursue a subspecialty career? No, because no they question. don't feel safe enough now to be sure. practicing general surgery? Yeah. Absolutely, without question. I mean, I, I get that as I talk to my own residents. This happens to be a year where it's the highest number of our residents going into private practice right out of training as ever. It's usually of our 10 chiefs, about six or seven go on to fellowship training. And that's in a program that probably has the high, one of the highest volumes in the country. We just don't have areas of, of where we have deficiency in defined categories. And they still feel like they need fellowship training. So no question about it. That's often driving the 70% fellowship rate in the US. So the second question about proficiency. Uh, you, you know, when you ask that uh, question, proficiency, and you do not promote the resident until they learn the technique, I do believe that would have the most impact from the resident side. Because, you know, no matter what you do, if, if you give them a, a very clear highway to proceed without having any responsibility, the resident may not step up to the plate, but if they know they have to perfect that technique in order for them to be promoted, then, uh, I think that's exactly what the University of Pittsburgh has been doing with, with minimal invasive surgery. They have seven steps. You have to pass the first step in order to do the second one. Second to three. If you do not pass it and be proficient, they will not let you go. And with that in mind, these reasons work really hard to make it happen. And same thing we have done with America's Hepatopankyatic Biliary Fellowship. There are rigid steps for them to perform in order to be promoted to the next level. It clearly sends a message to our residents the first time we held a resident back. And I don't think that had been done in many, many years. And then with the second one, I think they caught on. We're going to promote you only if we think you're ready for the next year. So there's no question it sends a message. We feel the same way about upside scores. And I get in trouble when I say this because the American Board of Surgery is really clear. You cannot hold back a resident because of upside. Well, there's always other reasons. But we really finally implemented a situation where we said, if you score below 10th percentile, two successive years, the language is, you may be held back. Now, seldom is that the only reason. So we'll tell the American board it's a lot of other reasons. But I just think we have to send a message. This is important stuff. And this is how you'll ultimately be accredited. And more importantly, this is how our program will be accredited. And it's interesting, again, when we finally put some teeth in that expectation, our upside scores have, have, have gone up. Yes. Thank you. So we have so much here to inspire uh, our department. And uh, I, I have a question because there's this tension, and, and, it, and it's between training the residents, and then they also are are caring for patients. And, and they and, and there are things that that we do as a team that need to get done through the day. And um, 
so how, when you first started and you were pulling these residents out from their clinical duties for these really valuable training sessions, did you notice what was their resistance because they were not, not available to do cases or to be available in clinic? Because especially with those interns, it's 12 two, two hour courses twice a week. I mean, that's a, I mean, that's awesome, it's admirable. Did you, was there something, when it was first starting, was there a growing pain where you had to fi find some mid-level providers to help compensate, or how did you? They loved it from the beginning. <laughs> no, of course there was tremendous resistance. I've been through this in two cycles. <clears throat> so the way I would handle this is I made sure the skills laboratory is right across from my office. And I remember the first few months I would walk across the street for a required surgical skills laboratory for second years and there'd be three missing. And so I would just say to the program coordinator, call them, find out where they are. I knew where they were. They were in the operating room. Yeah. And I would say, uh, tell them that Dr. Dunnington's waiting in the skills lab for them to get here. And so they started making the argument, but I could learn so much more in the OR. And my answer was, you're not ready for the OR yet. Now, chief residents, yes, but not first and second year residents. So there was that culture and the feeling that we were being unnecessarily restricted. Same with faculty. I would go over and check if the three faculty assigned to do this lab today are actually there. And if one is missing, I would call them up and I say, I was sure we scheduled this last August. What, what's the problem today? And again, we only had to do that about six months and they caught on that I was not gonna give up on this issue. And I think that culture change is critical to make sure it's highly valued, it's where you need to be if you're assigned to the skills lab. Uh, I'd have to go over much less now than I did early on. And what is interesting is it's predicted it takes five years in surgical training to change a culture. That's not a strange number of years, that's what you would predict. So for five years, still a little resistance, particularly from seniors. Now, the seniors would say to the juniors, I don't know how we would even train if we didn't have a skills library. What do, what do programs do that don't do this? Because it's become part of the routine in the culture. But you don't make any changes, these radical, this radical and what I think is for the better without someone driving that change so I've spent a lot of time reading books, everything I can find on how to change culture. How do you change it when they don't want to change? And so I've got a whole library full of that. Surgeons are not particularly fond of change, as you know. The other way is I want to give a final comment to the program director. Obviously, none of this happens without tremendous resources, and many of those resources come from your hospital. Early on, when I first started proposing a skills laboratory, I had a wonderful hospital administration at SIU. But the way the CEO sold it to their board was patient safety. So that as they rolled it out and introduced to the board, we're funding this new skills laboratory. They've, they advertise it as a new venture in patient safety because we have data that residents who train in a skills lab take less time to do a procedure and perform fewer errors. That's all we need. It's not a skills training. It's a patient safety issue. So I'm always careful to work that phrase into every conversation with a CEO who controls the first strings over and over again to help them justify their expense. Other thoughts, questions? Dr. Again, as a token of our appreciation, we wanted to present you with this. Thank you, sir. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.